So welcome everybody, uh, people who are in the audience and uh, whoever joined. It is uh, a pleasure to have with us uh, today Torsten Nab. He's coming from the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Garching, Munich, in Germany. Torsten uh, finished his PhD at uh, another Max Planck Institute, Max Planck for Astronomy in, uh, in Heidelberg. And then after being uh, for a while uh, a Cambridge fellow as a postdoc, uh, he came to the Max Planck for Astrophysics in Garching, where today he leads uh, his own research group. Uh, he's working in uh, computational astrophysics, uh, and body simulation, star formations, and all that nice stuff. And uh, the talk today, as you already see in your screens, is about the Griffin Project towards realistic simulations of galactic star cluster populations. Uh, we can uh, immediately start. As usual, uh, just for the economy of uh, the situation now with the webinars, uh, we keep all uh, questions at the end uh, of the talk, which will last for 45 minutes to an hour about, and then will be uh, five, 10 minutes uh, time for uh, anybody who wants to ask questions. Torstens, we can uh, start. Please go ahead. Thank and you. And I Pablo. ask everybody kindly to ask, to, to mute the microphones. Thank you, Panos, and thanks a lot for for the, intro, for the very nice invitation and the introduction. So I think, uh, so we met when I did my thesis in Heidelberg, which was quite some time ago already. <laughs> okay. Okay, today I will start about the Griffin project. And this is a project which we uh, have started to do more realistic simulations of galaxy uh, formation, galaxy evolution. Um, and you can already see in the background, this is a simulation of a turbulent ISM box. So the idea here is that we would like to understand galaxy evolution and the evolution of their interstellar medium at the same time, uh, which is a, a numerical and, and theoretical challenge. So as an introduction, um, uh, here is, a, is an image of M, M82, uh, a famous starburst galaxy. And you see these, this galaxy shows a very strong um, nuclear outflow. It's probably driven by star formation. And these outflows um, are very important for the evolution of galaxies because they regulate the amount of gas which is available for star formation during the full history of the evolution of galaxies. So galactic, galactic outflows are therefore um, very important for galaxy formation, in particular the formation of star forming galaxies and the evolution of star forming galaxies. And to understand their origin um, is one of the key aspects of understanding galaxy uh, evolution as a whole. Now, these outflows go to scales of kiloparsec um, on, on into the galactic halo, but they originate on much smaller scales. And their most likely origin is star formation in, in star clusters. And here you see an example on the left image. This is a little star cluster forming. Um, and it's already surrounded by an H2 region, which is the region ionized by the hot stars, massive hot stars born in this little star cluster. And this ionizing radiation will disperse the birth cloud, very likely for small clouds at least. And after the, the stars um, end their life, they explode as supernova and then they create hot gas and then they blow away what is left over from their birth cloud. So ionizing radiation is one form of what we call feedback, which is um, energetic processes which interact with the ambient medium of massive stars which are born in clusters. On the right uh, panel, you see another example of feedback and this is stellar winds. This is a little stellar wind bubble to the lower right you see here. 
um, fast winds of massive stars, which also impact the interstellar medium of galaxies. At the end of their lifetime, as I told you, the star, massive stars explode as supernovae. And here I have, it's actually not a fair comparison, but the picture is very nice. Uh, the images are very nice. These are type 1a supernova. Um, I, I'm mostly talking about type 2 supernova, so the end, st end stadium of uh, very, very mass massive stars, stars more massive than eight solar masses. And they create a hot phase and they create hot bubbles with strong, with, uh, strong shocks, which at, at some point might even be so strong that you have Fermi acceleration and relativistic acceleration um, of protons, uh, which I also work on, but I will not uh, talk about here in this talk. So here's an example of what such a star cluster looks like. This is one in the SMC, NGC 602. Um, this one has about 5,000 stars. It's relatively young, 5 million years old. Probably did not have a supernova explosion yet, but you see the, you know, you see the stars are very clustered. They, they live together and they have ionized their surrounding already. And in typical galaxy formation or evolution simulations, this cannot, this process of star cluster formation cannot be resolved. Um, it is not possible uh, to go to scales which are relevant for these processes. The, the resolution is much larger scales, like 100 parsec or 500 parsec even. But the clustering process itself is very important. And I here is a basically a summary of why this feedback for massive stars is important and why this clustering is important. And um, let me show you this as a comparison. So the dashed line in the in the in this diagram is the um, what I call the cosmic baryon function. It's the basically the dark matter halo mass function uh, corrected for the baryon budget. So this is what we assume from current cosmological models to be the, the mass function of galaxies if all the cosmic variants in dark matter halos would make it to, galax to a galaxy. But this is not happening. Um, and you can see this in an observed galaxy mass function, which are the black symbols here. The observed galaxy mass function shows strong deviations at low mass and strong deviations at high mass from this power law of the cosmic baryon function. And we think the deviation at low mass are mainly caused by uh, stellar feedback, which is the feedback processes I talked about. And the deviations at high masses are caused by feedback from accreting massive black, supermassive black holes which I will not address in my talk. And overlaid here are results from large scale cosmological simulation, which resulted in the conclusion I talked about. Um, and they're more or less, this is different, uh, different realizations of forms of stellar feedback in these simulations, all on sub-grid scale, sub-resolution scale, which led to the suppression of the galaxy masses at at low, in low mass dark matter halos in more or less good agreement with um, observations. Now, the, these implementation, these stellar feedback driven winds, which I introduced in the beginning, also are responsible for the formation of disk galaxies on a cosmological context. And here is an overview of six examples, which were, were early in the early 10, 2010 years, um, which were the first ones which actually have shown that it is possible to make models for realistic disk galaxies with um, empirical models for um, feedbacks, stellar feedback driven galactic outflows. So this highlights the importance of stellar feedback and highlights the importance of uh, driven outflows by massive stars, galactic outflows by massive stars. Now, the downside of at least the cosmological simulations I've showed the galaxy mass functions for 
is that the typical resolution is on the scale of 500 parsec, 100 parsec, 200, 500 parsec in this range. It's huge boxes, so we cannot afford to go to high resolution. And the description of the formulation for the interstellar medium is very approximate. So it's basically a sea of warm gas uh, with no structure below these scales. However, star formation definitely happens on much smaller scales. Star clusters have sizes of a few parsec to 10 parsec. So the interstellar medium actually does not look like this. It, it's actually, it actually looks like this, okay? And it's, it goes back to, to a, you know, seminal paper by McKean Ostrike in the 70s. Uh, the interstellar medium of galaxies where all the stars in the universe form is structured. So you have cold clouds surrounded by warm and neutral and ionized, warm neutral and ionized gas. And this, if the medium is star forming, is embedded in hot ionized gas. So we have a three phase medium. A few tens to 100 Kelvin cold, then a few hundreds to 10, 10 20,000 ion, warm, neutral, and ionized, and then the hot ionized gas all the way up to 10 to the 7 Kelvin. And most of the volume is actually in warm, in neutral, warm gas and ionized gas. And a lot of the mass, however, is in cold and neutral gas. And this, this ISM has several tracers which we can use to observe the physical properties of, of the ISM. Like here, C plus is tracing very cold gas, X-rays is tracing hot gas, CO molecular gas, gamma rays actually trace the cosmic rays, which I talked about. There are several emission lines, H alpha traces star formation and so on. So we have, we have a, whole, you know, a whole gallery of, of tracers, which we can use. Um, to determine the properties and which we then also can use to validate our models, which we develop for the interstellar medium. And you can imagine that you have a supernova going off. So a massive star is born in the cold phase and now a supernova goes off. If this supernova goes off in its dense birth environment, it will not do much because it will create a blast wave, but the blast wave evolution depends on the density, the ambient density, so we will just explode and nothing happens. If the supernova goes off in a lower density ambient medium, the blast wave will be stronger and you will have a larger region that is impacted by the uh, hot phase generated in the supernova explosion. If it goes off in the hot ionized phase, it's even stronger. So if you manage, to have a supernova rate which is high enough so that these hot bubbles generated by the supernova actually overlap, you will be able to create a stable hot phase. And this hot phase can, will expand and will drive, will be the driver for a galactic outflow. It might carry along with it cold and warm gas, but it has to be volume filling and it, it has to be clear that the supernova rate is high enough to create this volume filling phase. Now, this is a challenge for our uh, simulations. And here is an example for why this is a challenge. So we have here an idealized setup. Um, this is work by my former PhD student, Cho Yu Hu, an idealized setup of an individual supernova explosion in a, um, in a box, in an ISM box of cold phase ISM at different resolutions. So this is particle-based hydrodynamic simulations. Here the, on the right, the resolution is 100 solar masses, then 10 solar masses, and on the left, one solar mass. So the highest resolution is on the left. And corresponding to the resolution, we inject of course, the, the supernova energy of 10 to the 51 arcs in a larger region because our resolution is lower, also our spatial resolution is lower. And then we let the supernova evolve. And what you will see in the top panel is density and the bottom panel is temperature. So we inject the energy as thermal energy, and then we let the supernova evolve. And you can see something very crazy. Uh, 
in the low resolution version on the right, the blast wave is gone. And it's even worse, the temperature is even colder than before and the density is even higher than before because with the supernova, we have also injected metals. The metals enhance the cooling. So we basically overcool the whole supernova explosion. So if you do a simulation at this resolution, you will put in supernova explosions, but nothing will happen. And you cannot study the multiphase ISM because your resolution is just simply not good enough. Um, this is known, and this is the so-called overcooling problem. And this is the reason why larger scale simulations have to rely on sub-resolution models to kind of you know, make this go away. Um, by creating winds by hand or by some physical prescription. Now, our aim is not to do this, but to go to a high enough resolution, which actually does a good job at least representing the blast waves created by individual supernova. So we cannot yet afford one solar mass resolution simulation. So we are a bit in the middle of what I call here 10 solar mass and one solar mass. You see the simulation on the left has a very nice blast wave. You have a hot phase in the center. You really create your hot medium, which is then responsible for driving the outflow. So we are not absolutely there yet, but we are on our best way. And this is a little detour, but it's, it's very educational. I told you that it is important what the ambient density of, an, of a supernova explosion is and what its impact on the interstellar medium is. And we have done a series of very idealized simulations. So this is just a stratified disk. It represents the midplane of a disk, of a star forming disk here. You see a slice. Um, in density and in temperature. So the top view here is in temperature and the bottom, bottom row. And all these ISM simulations have the same supernova rate. And we just change the location of the supernova. So on the left here, we let all supernova explode at the peak densities. In the middle, we only have half of the supernova at peak densities and the other half explodes at random locations in a given scale height. And on the right, everything is random. All supernova explode randomly. And you can see in this you know, idealized case where all supernova explode in the dense phase, we only have a two phase medium. We only have cold gas at about 100 K and we have warm gas at about 10 to the four Kelvin. Only if we let the supernova explode at lower environmental densities, we generate a hot phase. And more so if more supernova explode at low ambient densities. So this is, this is very fundamental and it's very important um, because it tells us that most likely supernova actually don't go off in high density environments. And this is plausible because if before the supernova explode, and I've shown you this in the introduction, the massive stars actually push away the ISM already by ionizing with ionizing radiation and with um, stellar winds. And also if the star formation is clustered, you have a star cluster, the first supernova might clear out the region in the star cluster. So the second supernova and the third supernova go off in low ambient densities generated by the first one. So this is what probably has to happen to generate a multiphase ISM as it is observed. Okay, here is a, here a few more, in, a bit more information on the Griffin project. So these are simulations of dwarf galaxies because this is limited mostly to about 10 to the eight solar masses in galaxy mass. Uh, we have solar mass gas resolution. Uh, we have a spatial resolution of 0 0.5, 0 0.1 parsec. Um, we assume a high star formation efficiency. So the trans, you know, the, the um, formation of gas into stars at high densities. We, and then we realize individual stars in the simulation. And the stars are drawn from a Krupa initial mass function. 
So we realize every massive star in a stochastic way. Um, we use stellar evolution tracks to follow its evolution. It's, and then we trace the uh, interstellar radiation field for photoelectric heating, which we have in a non-equilibrium cooling network. And their main sequence lifetime, and also their, the time of their supernova explosion. So we follow individual stars, individual massive stars in the simulation. Our time steps are of the order of 100 to 1,000 years in the, in the densest regions. Um, and this is about the uh, time resolution we have. We follow the uh, stellar evolution checks, of course, you know, um, uh, tabulated and then interpolated. So we have the compute, we have the complete stellar interstellar radiation field. So this is the 6 EV to 13 6 EV uh, radiation field. We assume optically thin limit. And this is important because. The, this radiation field is, is responsible for the photoelectric heating of the interstellar medium, uh, which, is a, which is one of the most important heat sources at high densities and low temperature ISM. And we assume an optically thin limit. And then we compute the local shielding uh, of dust and the self shielding with the um, algorithm called Tricol. I won't talk more about this. Um, and we trace chemical species, so H plus H, H2, CO, and E minus, and also helium chemistry in the dense medium of the galaxies. Photoionization, we do not do photoionization radiative transfer properly, but we use a simple Strombrin approach, which means around them, we, we know the uh, Lyman continuum flux for the massive stars, and we ionize all the, all the gas within the strom radius of such a star. It's very technical, but it's just important for completeness. And this is uh, all together in the Griffin project. And there's a web page if you're interested with all the papers and some movies and more information about this. Um, here is a, here is a um, just to showcase that uh, what we can do with the simulations in principle. Um, and here is an example for the amount of hot gas, which is created by a single supernova in an ambient density of uh, ambient median of the density on the y axis. So at a density of 100 particles, you have a few hundred solar masses and hot gas at a density of 10 to the minus two, you have two orders of magnitude more hot gas. And we just confirm that our code is able to, to follow the expected uh, theoretical values. Here's a view of what such a simulation looks like. Um, this is a dwarf galaxy of 10 to the eight solar masses in the center, and we just show the gas distribution. And you can see these bubbles, which are created by photonization and mostly supernova explosions. You see um, filaments, cold filaments of gas. Uh, you see groups of uh, cold gas, groups of cold clumps. So there's a lot of structure. You can see spiral features here. There's a lot of structure um, in these simulations and they have a very high dynamical fidelity. The, um, I hope you can see this movie, but I just want to show you the case for, these, for this idealized simulation. Um, the left is a view of the, H, the, of the neutral hydrogen distribution uh, face on an edge on. In the middle, you can see the molecular hydrogen distribution. And on the right, you can see the um, ionized hydrogen and all these bubbles that uh, here you know, come up in red. Every bubble is this explosion of a single star, of a single massive star in the simulation. So we have reached relatively good resolution so that we can actually try to follow the um, evolution of the multiphase interstellar medium. And you can see here a phase diagram um, showcasing of what we can do. This is temperature versus density. So we've resolved from 10 to the seven down to a few tens of Kelvin. 
and about eight orders of magnitude in density. And the black curve here is the equilibrium cooling curve. Um, and this is what, you know, how the distribution for such a simulation looks like in the phase diagram. Um, this is an example of what the interstellar radiation field looks like. Uh, you see a map of the interstellar radiation field in units of G0, which is the solar value um, on the left. And on the right, you see a radial distribution and the vertical distribution and with the individual peaks generated by the individual star clusters here. This is very important because um, it is important to to have these heated to account for these heating effects um, in in high density regions of uh, star formation. So we can do. Um, I just show an overview here. Uh, we can do a lot of experiments here. For example, we can test separately the impact of photoelectric heating (PE), photoionization, and supernova explosions on the structure of the interstellar medium. And I should just highlight a few extreme cases. For example, this simulation here, top left, is our fiducial simulation. And the simulation on the bottom left has no supernova explosions and no photoionization. And you see, it's very different, OK? So no bubbles, no structure. No hot phase. Hot phase here would be the blue. This is the density representation. So the hot phase would be the low density material. So this is clearly wrong. This is not what the ISM of a galaxy looks like. Um, photoionization has some effect, but it's not extremely strong. Uh, photoelectric itself, also it's, it's subtle, so, but it cannot be seen here. There's an interesting, um, another interesting effect if you compare the top left picture or the top pictures as a whole with this picture on the bottom right. So what we have changed here is we have just um, not allowed for the massive stars to follow their full evolution tracks, but have forced every massive star to explode its supernova after 3 million years. Typically, it starts after 5 to 6 million years and goes on to 40 million years, depending on the mass of the star. So here, we have just forced the star to explode after 3 million years as an experiment. The result of this experiment, however, is very interesting. If we look at the top plot here is the outflow rate. Bottom plot is what we call mass loading. The mass loading is the ratio of the outflow rate over the star formation rate of the system. All the simulations have a similar star formation rate, but the outflow rate is very different. In the simulation I showed you before, where we don't allow the stars to evolve for, for their whole life, the outflow rate is about, well, at least one order of magnitude lower than in our fiducial simulation. And so is the mass loading. So this mass loading number tells you how much mass is transported out of the, uh, out of the galaxy in units of the star formation rate. So if this is higher than one, it means that more gas is leaving the galaxy than is transformed into stars. So that's a very surprising result. At first, we thought this was very surprising. Um, but then we have looked at the distribution of the ambient density of the supernova explosions. And this is what you see on the right. And again, here, look at the black curve, which is highlighted, our fiducial model. And the, the pink curve here, which is the model with the truncated lifetime for the massive stars. And you see many, many more supernova go off in high ambient densities, which is... Um, and this is the explanation. So the supernova, the, the number of supernova is comparable, but the supernova go just off at lower densities. This is because the photonization has more time to work and the stars can travel out of their birthplaces for longer and to explode at low ambient densities. So that's a very, very strong effect, and it highlights the importance of being able to resolve the small scale structure and have the relevant physical processes included. So um, 
this was an idealized dwarf galaxy and it's a relatively low density star forming system. And to create more extreme star forming systems, we have just smashed two of these galaxies together to create a starburst. And here's, an, here's a, a reminder of the phase diagram for such a simulation that I show a movie in a second. Um, so here you see the phases we resolve 10 to the eight to a few tens of Kelvin and even you know, about 10 orders of magnitude in uh, density. So at high densities here, which is the black line here, uh, we have a genes mass based threshold for star formation. So all gas which goes over this threshold is automatically turned into stars. And gas in this intermediate regime between the dashed line and the solid line is turned, can form stars, but it has attached a given star formation efficiency per free fall time. So per free for per local free fall time, we turn a specific fraction um, into stars, which has proven to give to, to be give very good comparisons to observations. And the pressure density diagram is shown on the right for comparison. So here's a movie of the, such a merger. So we have two of these dwarfs here still separated. They had its, their first encounter already. And then we move on and you see the stellar distribution on the left, the gas surface density in the middle temperature on the right. And we create this extreme starburst. And you can already see, and this is work Natalia Lahen, she's a postdoc at the moment at MPA, was a PhD student back then with Peter Jonsen in Finland. You can already see in the star, so every star here is actually, so we realize all stars more massive than four solar masses of the IMF. So every, every point here is a single star, okay? Um, and you can already see there are star clusters. You can see the clustering here on the left. And we have a hot phase, we have cold clumps. So this looks pretty realistic. So what Natalia has done is she has now looked at all these star clusters, identified them with the friends of friends algorithm. And here is an example for the star cluster distribution. This is the gas distribution, stellar distribution. And these are all the individual clusters that are identified with this uh, new simulation approach. And then uh, she has grouped it uh, then we have used also this, the same methodology we have used to identify cold gas clouds, because we think the stars, of course, form in cold clouds, and the cold clouds uh, is, you know, identifying the cold clouds is equally important. So we have used the same strategy. And this was work of Konstantina Fotopoulou. Uh, she is a PhD student currently in my group. So she has looked at the simulation at the cold gas, and you can see here a zoom in. So all this blue material here is cold below 300 Kelvin gas, uh, which is star forming and which is basically represents monocular clouds. And she, she has um, quantified the cloud mass function, which is shown here on the right. And this is as with time. So a cloud mass function at different times of the simulation. And they all look like they follow power law, which is very, very much in agreement with what is observed and with the slope of 10 to the minus, uh, with the slope of minus 1.8, um, which is shown here for comparison. So the simulation actually reproduces a realistic uh, cloud mass function. And uh, here is another example. Um, if we increase the threshold for detecting uh, the clouds uh, from 100 particles per cubic center to 2,000 particles per cubic centimeter, we still recover a power law mass function. So this also shows that the structure of our clouds is self-similar, which is also uh, approximately what is observed. So we, we have some dynamic range even within the clouds which can be probed and agrees well with observations. Also, the Larsen relations seem to look very good. Now for the uh, star clusters, um, we have done the same experiment and the star cluster mass function, let me show you here. 
uh, first, this is the star cluster mass function at different times and different colors here. Also, the star cluster mass function seems to follow like a, a power law with a slope of 10 to the, uh, with a slope of minus two. Also in agreement with observations, here's an example from, uh, from a dwarf galaxy sample from Cook et al. And the slopes here for, with, a, with a bit of a shift. So the normalization doesn't matter here. It's just the slope of the SMC and LMC star cluster mass function slope looks in pretty good agreement with observations. Uh, on the right here, we have picked out a, a specific time uh, to highlight uh, the, the, what we can do with the simulations. So this looks pretty good. So now if we count all the mass and clusters and compute not only a star formation rate of the dwarf merger, this is the black line here, this is the star formation rate. So we have the first encounter with a peak. We have the second encounter with a coalescence. We can also compute a cluster formation rate. So what is the rate of forming clusters in this simulation? Star clusters, so these are the black dots here. It's typically lower than the star formation rate and the offset between the star formation rate and the cluster formation rate changes. The red line is just a comparison and the red dots for the isolated simulation. And here on the right, um, we show the representation of the star formation rate of the simulation in the Kennecott-Schmidt plot. And this is the star formation rate surface density. This is the gas surface density. Gray dots here are on the background are observed data. And this is done as a function of time. So the idea, the, the isolated galaxies are down here. Then the system starts interacting gas surface density goes up and then the system is coalescing and the star formation, oops, star formation rate surface density peak. No, sorry. Star formation rate surface density is peak. So the system goes into a star burst, okay? And this is the nice thing about this idealized merger simulation. We can create star burst conditions, uh, you know, without worrying too much um, about how we, how we create them. It's just, you know, very dense gas in a starburst condition. And then we can compare, um, we can do comparison to observations. And here is one, a nice one. This gamma parameter here is the so-called cluster formation efficiency. So this tells you what fraction of stars is formed in star clusters compared to the total star formation rate. So the observational data are these crosses here. Um, and in the, the, so there's a typical trend for higher star formation rate surface density systems to have more stars forming in clusters. There's some debate in the literature of how strong this trend is in the observational literature. So there's a lot of scatter here. But our simulations, which are the colored points here, follow the same trend. We seem to have a higher fraction of stars forming in clusters, which might be very likely is still a limitation of our simulation. But it's, of course, expected because we're just starting with this and we, we cannot expect to have the full answer to all the questions yet. But we seem to see a trend that more extreme star formation environments have more stars forming in star clusters. And we have tested this, and this is work by Jessica Islop, another PhD student um, at MPA. Um, and what she has done, she has changed the star formation efficiency. Um, our fiducial simulation is this one here. We have a 2% star formation efficiency. We can do lower ones and we can do higher ones like up to 50%. So this makes it easier for stars to form in dense regions. And this makes it more difficult. The lower efficiencies makes it more difficult for stars to form in dense regions. And here we have computed for all the star clusters, the virial parameter. So if this is above one, the star cluster is very bound, gravitationally bound. And you can see if you make it very difficult for stars to form, the gas clouds can collapse and we form very dense and very bound systems. And we can regulate this with this efficiency parameter 
for 50% efficiency before much less clusters and with the clusters partially actually unbound. So they're just stellar associations. And how this looks like um, in a stellar surface density plot, you can see on the left. So here we form a lot of dense clusters and here the clusters form, but they're relatively easy dissolved. And then we have a nice you know, disk of stars. And this is a comparison of these four simulations with their star formation rate, their outflow rate, and their mass loading. And you can see there's not such a big difference. Different of the stars, but the rates are not so different. However, we see a trend, and this is in Jessica's paper, described in Jessica's paper, that more clustered simulations actually in later phases drive stronger outflows. So the clustering of the stars has an impact on the outflow. And the process is, as I described before, the process is driven by um, the clustering, creating lower ambient densities for the supernova to explode. And uh, this is the fraction of stars forming in clusters. Also for these four simulations, you can see the same trend. For the low efficiency, for the high efficiency simulations, we see a lower fraction of stars in clusters, and there's a difference between bound and, un, and, and total associations. So a smaller fraction, very small fraction of star clusters actually are bound. A lot of them are associations. For low efficiencies, all of them, most of them are bound. So the, the, the how, how strongly bound a cluster is can be regulated by this parameter. And we, have, we need more investigations here to create a good model for star cluster formation. Now in this galaxy merger, we form very massive clusters as well. We have a power law mass function, which goes all the way up to 10 to the six solar masses. And here's an example. This is the formation time of the first and the second and the third most massive cluster. And interestingly, the third cluster, the massive cluster that forms in this simulation is created by a super shell here, uh, which is driven by the first, by the supernova explosions of the first cluster. And here is a formation simulation. I hope this can be seen on your screen. And on the top left, you will see the stellar evolution, stellar surface density. This is on the right, this is gas surface density, temperature and pressure. And the time resolution here is very high. So the whole simulation will take 10 million years. It's just a little piece of the five, 600 million year simulation and I let it run. Um, and you can see the shell arriving. So the blast wave arriving from this cluster here. Now we sweep up this shell here of gas. You can see it coming in. We form uh, many, many little proto clusters here. These merge, they're gas and stars. This gas clumps and star clusters, they merge, they form two relatively massive star clusters, which then finally merge and form the most massive star cluster of the simulation. And all of this happens in 10 million years. And we were very excited about this because this actually answers a lot of questions. How can massive, why do massive, why can massive, why do massive star clusters show such a small age spread, for example? All of this is over in 10 million years. And if you let the simulation run further, the gas will be expelled. And this massive cluster is in the mass range of a globular cluster. And if we look at the surface density profiles of this, of this cluster, and also the second more massive, and third most massive one here, this is the red and the, the, the uh, uh, blue and the, and the yellow line here. These are surface density profiles and we compare to observed globular cluster profiles. The agreement is quite good. Um, also, when we look at structural properties like velocity dispersion, our three clusters are the red symbols here, half mass radius and st central stellar surface density compared to globular cluster observations, which are the colored points on the background. It's structural properties similar, very similar to a globular cluster. 
So such a low density starburst environment, if you imagine in high, at high redshift, would be a very, very nice environment for generating actually global clusters, which is very, we were very excited about because we have a process which can explain global cluster formation in a simulation. And on the left, you see an evolution of the gas surface density here, the solid line and the, sorry, the dashed lines and the stellar surface density, why this most massive cluster is forming. And you can see the gas density builds up to densities which are not so extreme. But while the star gas stars, gas is forming stars, the stellar density actually grows up to 10 to the 6, which, are, which is reasonable for global clusters. So, um, and all of this happens within 10 million years. And then the difference from the blue line here to the, to the uh, purple line here is relaxation, which is not perfectly resolved in the simulations, but we do, we do have relaxation. Um, to some degree in our simulations. So this is a very nice uh, model for globular cluster formation and we liked it a lot. Natalia has done analysis of the rotation of these star clusters and compared them uh, to observed star clusters. Um, and on the left, you see the line of sight velocities of our clusters with observations in the background and the dispersion profiles with observed clusters in the background. So they. They seem not to be inconsistent with what is observed for massive star clusters. Um, and recently, Natalia has done a post-processing of our simulation. I'll just show you this nice movie. This is a BVI color composite at HST resolution of this whole dwarf starburst. You can see, you can nicely see the star clusters here um, in the simulation. And this is a zoom in. And we not only do this for fun, we can create full SEDs of this starburst system. And this is the white line here, all the way from attenuated starlight to dust emission. So covering three, four orders of magnitude in wavelength. And this agrees pretty well with what with observed SEDs from uh, starbursting systems, which also supports the scientific val validity of our simulation model, which is always has to be tested and we always have limitations in the models, of course. And we can go one step further. So we can not only compute the star cluster mass function from the simulation itself, what is, this is the gray line here. We can also apply observer selection criteria with apertures. This is illustrated here in the top panel for a closer system and the bottom panel for a system which is further away and determine the cluster mass function observationally, so to speak, and see what the effect is on the observed slope of the cluster mass function. You can see we lose low mass clusters because they are not resolved anymore in the observations and the cluster mass function seems to be a bit shallower than the underlying intrinsic cluster mass function. So there's a lot more to work on in the future. And I would like to conclude um, with a few points. So the, the, the ISM and the massive stars drive galaxy evolution, at least internally. There is a component which I've not addressed, which is the cosmological inflow of gas and the cosmological model uh, which we cannot address with idealized simulations, of course. And it's a major challenge to understand these processes in a multi-phase medium of the ISM. And I've shown you the enormous dynamic range have to be resolved. And we have gone a step further, but we are, of course, not there yet. We have not resolved all supernova, many, but not all supernova explosions. We have approximations for radiation transfer and so on. But we have some requirements. We need high enough mass resolution and spatial resolution to actually represent the multi-phase medium and the structure of the clouds on, sub, on parsec scales. Because this only then we can, uh, we can reproduce plausible and realistic ambient density distributions of the ISM and 
determine the driving processes for supernova explosions, which are the most important processes setting the structure of the ISM. And the most energetic, and the, is this the only process uh, or the dominant process generating hot gas in the interstellar medium? And this has to be resolved to actually understand how outflows in galaxies are driven. Um, with these simulations, um, with I, I call here resolved galaxies, of course, this is not really resolved, it's just resolved if you compare to previous galaxy simulations. <laughs> Um, but we have a good model for a global cluster formation and, and a reasonable simulation from, you know, from formation of the clouds to the cluster to its final state, which is actually, I think, a success. Um, however, now with these simulations, it's, 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 it's pretty, you know, it's nice because I think it's scientific process progress, but uh, we, we run into new problems because now uh, we have individual stars and we have realized that, um, we have to realize that our integration schemes are not accurate enough to, um, to follow the internal cluster dynamics at long time scales. So we're working on this and we, we are developing new codes, a higher order integration schemes like the frost code with anti Rantala. Um, to be able to follow this in the future, we have to explore resolution limits. Uh, we still have a sub-resolution model for star formation, which has to be adjusted to the high dynamical ranges we have here. We need more tests of physical processes, convergence tests, code comparison, and so on. <clears throat> and I think um, the next step here um, actually would be to, to develop a new class of uh, algorithms with higher order integration schemes to make more progress and do this um, more self-consistently in the future. Thank you. So I'm muted. Many thanks, Torsten, for the very, very interesting talk and a uh, lot of information that you gave us. Uh, uh, so let me see now if uh, first in the audience there is a question and then we can. Okay. Uh, I will transfer the question anyway. Congratulations for the. Okay. Yanis Kondopoulos is asking if uh, there is, uh, if magnetic fields play any role to all these processes that you described uh, right now. Yeah. Um, they do. Uh, so we have a we have another uh, another project path, uh, which is called the Silk Project, and this is the pro the simulations I've shown you of these stratified boxes. That was a different code, and there we can also work with magnetic fields, and we have tested the impact of magnetic fields. The um, and we have seen a few things. So magnetic fields due to the magnetic pressure delay the collapse of dense clouds. Uh, they don't prevent it, but they delay the collapse of dense clouds and the cloud structure is a bit different. If the fields become very strong, we, we can prevent some of the star formation in the simulation by this process. Now this is idealized MHD. We have uh, this is the only experience I have. Um, it's not without ambipolar diffusion. We don't. I don't think we have even in this idealized simulation. We don't have the um, we don't have the resolution to you know go more into the cloud structure on small scales. There is another effect of magnetic fields, or let's say the non-thermal component of the interstellar medium. And this is, this seems to be very important, uh, which is the driving of winds by cosmic rays. So we have in this simulation branch, we have um, uh, injected cosmic rays generated in super, so protons, high energy cosmic rays, and which are allowed to diffuse along the magnetic field lines we have in this simulation. And these, cosmic rays then build up a pressure gradient. They have very little losses. So the energy losses are, are relatively little. 
And they build up pressure gradients and this pressure gradient, if coupled back to the gas, can drive outflows. So we have some papers on this. Um, and this is, at least from the outflow perspective, an important impact of the magnetic field. Of course, there are uncertainties, um, you know, how you implement this cosmic ray driving, uh, but we cannot do this in the simulations here at the moment because I don't have a particle-based MHD implemented. Cosmic rays are produced in the shops, so the supernova shops. Do you have cosmic rays now, now in your simulations? Uh, we don't have it in the dwarf simulations I've shown you. Uh, we have cosmic rays in the uh, idealized disk simulations that we run um, for smaller patches of the interstellar medium. Uh, but this is a different code. This is AMR grid code simulations with flash. And the simulations I've shown here are SPH particle-based hydro simulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I have seen there is a question from the audience here, but we lost it in chat. Would you like to, uh, is there, uh, can you see that, uh, Torsten? I see that. It says, okay, Peter, okay. Perhaps, thank you for the very interesting talk. Would the following be realistic? Could these clusters produce enough stellar mass like holes that would merge to an intermediate mass black hole in turn with the C uh, that in turn would be would see the formation of S supermassive black holes at high redshift. <laughs> yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think in principle, yes. Now <laughs> um, it's very tricky uh, to decide to actually prove this. So uh, let me tell you what we have done. So with another PhD student, we have performed simulations, n-body simulations, very accurate n-body simulations of dense star clusters with properties similar to what I've shown here, okay? Dense and young star clusters, including binary stellar evolution models and so on. This is, these are simulations with n-body 6++ GPU code. And uh, these simulations indicate that with a process uh, driven by collisions of stars, so early collisions of stars gener generating mass collision of stars with black holes, you can generate black holes exceeding the stellar mass limit. So we do form black holes of 300, 400 solar masses. Okay, 200, 300, which is on the low end of the intermediate mass black hole range. Now, um, when these black holes collide with other black holes, which also is also something we have, they might be kicked out of the cluster. Um, so the, it is plausible that if you form such a star cluster at the center of a galaxy, as a nuclear star cluster, um, that in this case, the potential is deep enough so that the kicked black holes stay and you can have runaway growth by tidal capture. And this is also something we are exploring at the moment. I have a, another PhD student, uh, Lazarus Suetzis. Uh, he's I think from Thessaloniki. He just arrived a couple of uh, months ago. And he is trying to investigate this process in more detail. And I think, in my view, this then is the path. This can be the path towards forming the seeds for supermassive black holes at high redshift because the process is very rapid. This um, black hole, seed black hole formation process takes only 20, 30 million years. It's over after the relaxation of the cluster and gas expulsion. So, so this is also the reason why I would like to push the simulations I've shown you here to a stage where we can accurately follow the stellar dynamics and accurately follow the stellar collisions in the clusters that we form with gas. It will take a couple of years <laughs> more, uh, but I think that's, a, that's exactly the direction I'm, I'm working on. Okay. Uh... Other questions from here around? 
uh, let, let me ask you something, Thorsten. Is there uh, any difference in all these properties, especially about the clustering of a star form region between, uh, let's say, a star form region in a dwarf galaxy before colliding with uh, another dwarf? And uh, those that we meet close to the standard uh, spiral arms of grand design galaxies. Um, or, uh, same, or, I mean, especially I'm interested about the, the, the clustering, how long, if there are differences in the time that uh, these new clusters are bound or they dissolve. Okay, uh, so there, 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 there are different questions. Uh, so the, the, we think, but we don't know yet from simulations, we think the star formation process is relatively, cluster formation process relatively universal. It's just that at high density environments, which are generated here, and this is a particular environment because it has very low shear. So the, the, the circular velocity of the, of the dwarfs are very low, and the shear is very low. So we can bring in a lot of gas on a short time scale, which is not shearing apart, okay? So, and, and we think this might be the reason why we can form so massive clusters on such a short time scale. In spiral arms, the, first of all, the star formation rate density is not, uh, the, the gas density is not so high, the rate density is not so high. Shear might be more important. Uh, so you just might not form as massive clusters um, as you have here. So the idea is that the cluster mass clusters always form with a power law mass function. The normalization is set by the by the by the environmental properties, so density and probably shear. So you have higher normalization, which also results in more massive, most massive clusters. In extremer in, in more extreme environments, the cluster disruption problem we have not solved yet. So these clusters, observation observationally, the clusters. So let's say per dex in time, um, ninety percent of the clusters should be dissolved. So uh, you know, in the first hundred million years, you should lose ninety percent of the clusters. In the next um, Giga year, you should you lose another 90% of all the clusters because all the old stars we see are not in clusters. And if you if you check cluster mass functions at different ages, uh, their normalization goes down. And we have we not we are not at the moment we are not able to accurately capture the cluster disruption processes. We capture the formation pretty well but not the disruption. I showed you that for our fiducial model, the clusters are very bound. So they basically hang around forever, okay? They're so bound that they don't dissolve. The origin of this could be manifold. Either we don't capture the right processes, the right structure at formation, or the integrator we have is just not able to capture the internal dynamical processes like relaxation, um, mass aggregation and so on accurately enough to support cluster disruption. Very nice, very nice. So uh, other questions, let me see here again, we have, uh, well, it's not a question, I think, but. Yeah, let me just read it. I think it's yes. uh, uh, Costa, so ask the first question. Uh, thank you very much for the detailed answer. Indeed, recalling can play a role, but Maybe the conditions at high redshift, high gas content likely prevent large kicks. Laura Brecker has extensively worked on recalls of supermassive black holes. Yes, uh, that's true. It could be that, that uh, the conditions are a bit different. Uh, the, the metallicity, for example, is, is much lower. The stellar mass distribution, black hole mass distribution is different. Um, uh, that's, that's correct. Um, and we have also we have just, I mean, Laura has worked on this and she has, a, she has um, a, a, a very nice papers. Uh, we, we also have uh, with another project uh, just published a paper uh, from a cosmological simulation, which actually allows the accurate, relatively accurate treatment of black hole kicks 
in the assembly of a supermassive black hole. Um, now this is supermassive black hole mergers, but there the kicks, it could be that they are not large enough so that the, Gallic, the black hole actually comes back to the system. Either this or because the galaxies continue to merge with other galaxies, even if one black hole is lost, another galaxy brings in another supermassive black hole and replaces the one that was already there. Um, so there are, there are a lot of complications and a lot of potential solutions, uh, which I think at the moment are still all on the market. And it's very difficult to currently see um, how this actually really works. Great. So, no more questions. Maybe is there anybody else who wants to ask? If not, many thanks, Thorsten. It was really we enjoyed the talk.